So Judge Faye Hoover is uh, Hoover Grundy is a familiar face around here. So <laughs> I asked her to administer the oath of office. So I'm really glad she's here. So. I want to apologize for my tardiness. Uh, I was scheduled to work out of town. I did work out of town. And every time you have some place to be, the traffic is really slow. <laughs> so hopefully um, no traffic uh, cameras. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see. So, um, and I, this is not about me. This is about Nick. And this is about what a great moment for the city of Marion. I'm, I am so humbled and honored to be here. I was just tickled when Nick um, called me and asked me to administer the oath today. Um, Nick and I go back to high school. Um, I've known Nick for a long, long time, um, know many of his family members, and this is a great, great opportunity um, for Nick Abwasley, and it is a wonderful thing for the city of Marion. So congratulations, Thank Nick. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If you would please raise your right hand. And if you would repeat after me, I, Nick Abuasley. I, Nick Abuasley. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Iowa. And the Constitution of the State of Iowa. And the ordinances of the City of Marion, Iowa. And the ordinances of the City of Marion, Iowa. And that I will faithfully and impartially and that I will faithfully and impartially do the best of my ability do the best of my ability discharge all the duties of the office of mayor discharge all the duties of the office of mayor in the city of Marion, Iowa in the city of Marion, Iowa as now or hereafter required by law as now or hereafter required by law congratulations Thank mayor I have just a few words to say, and then I think we will do the uh, um, administer the oath of office to the council members. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, this is a very special day for me. I'd like to thank especially uh, Judge Faye Hoover Grindy, who was gracious enough to make time to be here to administer the oath of office. As she said, we go way back to high school, so it, it's uh, uh, I'm really honored that she was able to be here to uh, be part of this ceremony. I want to welcome all my family who's here, um, my aunt and uncle who traveled for a long ways to, to be with us, uh, my wife Christiane and our children, my parents, uh, my brothers, sisters, uh, cousins, my aunt and uncle, my uncle Michelle and his wife, um, all my family who's here. Um, the decision uh, that you uh, make when you take on this role is not an easy one, and it affects you know everyone that uh, that is close to you, your family, your friends. And I'm so grateful to my family and friends for their support. Uh, as you all know, my my close circle is not really so small, uh, and it's wonderful to have such a strong safety net and support network around me. I'd like to welcome all the former mayors who were introduced earlier. Um, I invited these gentlemen here today, and um, also Mayor Busca was, was uh, supposed to be here, but he must have had something come up. But I, I invited these gentlemen here today to thank them on behalf of myself and the city of council and the city in general um, for having served as mayors of Marion. Um, I'm humbled that the citizens of Marion have uh, given me the honor and privilege of being included in this group of leaders, so I decided to share this day with them. Marion is not what it is today by pure chance. 
each mayor working with the city council and the city staff, community and business leaders, has played a role in moving Marion forward to where it is today. And so we have inherited all their work and all their efforts, all their vision and their leadership. And I'm sure that they face many challenges along the way, but everyone who takes on this role does so because they care about Marion, because they want to do good in their community. So I'd like to thank them all for their service and leadership that has made our town a great place to live and raise families and do business. So please join me in, in thanking them again. As I've said on numerous occasions, I believe in the potential of Marion. And I do. I always have. We have a very special place here. A long and proud history, great schools, and by the way, I'd like to uh, recognize the superintendent of Marion School District who's here today, Colonel Chris Dyer. So, welcome. <laughs> Our historic downtown that is revitalizing, our safe neighborhoods. As proud as we are of our town, we can always do more. If we stop improving ourselves, we stagnate and risk moving backwards. And fortunately, we currently have great opportunities to do more. Opportunities on all levels for an improved quality of life and for families, individuals, and businesses to achieve their goals. The increased interest in our community and the list of accomplishments and accolades in the past few years speak for themselves. So others see it, but do we see it? I hope we do, because that's the key. My hope is that we as a community will not settle for what's simply what's good enough, but we'll work together to identify and pursue the right opportunities expecting and striving in everything we do to achieve the best for our city and its citizens. Our city is growing. That's a fact that we can't avoid. Hundreds of families are moving to Marion each year, and it's no secret that growth is accompanied by challenges and issues, issues related to how we adjust to the growth, how we accommodate growth and handle the demands that growth brings about, to ensure that it doesn't impact our lives in a negative way, but that we benefit from it and it impacts us positively. We have to deal with these challenges in a fiscally responsible manner and find the right opportunities that make sense for our city. But very importantly, how we deal with our challenges will tell the world who we are as a community. You see, my belief in Marion's potential is really belief in Marion's people. People make this city what it, was it, what it is. It's the people who care about their town and the opportunities we have here, who step forward to serve a public office, who volunteer on committees, boards, and commissions, who contribute ideas, time, and resources to make a positive impact, and who self selflessly do what is needed to make our little corner of the world a better place. It's neighbors who care about each other, it's talented city staff, who make sure that our city provides the services and the quality of life that our citizens desire and expect and deserve. It's the 37,000 plus citizens and the many business owners who have made a choice to be here, to be located in Marion. We have great people here. So I believe that the people of Marion can set a new standard. A new standard for an engaged, informed citizenry a new standard for civil discourse based on mutual respect. A new standard for listening to each other, truly understanding each other and working together, knowing that we don't have to agree on everything, but always remembering that we are on the same team. We all care about our city. So even when we have differing opinions, let's give each other the benefit of the doubt, treating each other as teammates rather than members of opposing sides. Let's talk to each other, not past each other. Let's treat each other with kindness and discuss our issues and differences in an honest way, using our best effort to find compromise and common ground. Because ultimately, this is how we're gonna move forward. 
We're all in this together, and we accomplish so much more when we work together. Marion deserves our best, and nothing less. People ask me why I wanted this job, and the answer is simple. It's an honor to serve my community. I've lived here for 40 years, and I can't imagine another place where I'd want to call my hometown. I've been working for the good of this community for two decades, and will continue to do the same as mayor. My goal is to see our city thrive and provide great opportunities for its citizens. <laughs> but I can't do this alone, and I don't, I don't have all the answers. So my door is open and my hand is extended to all who wish to contribute their insight and their ideas to help our city be its best. I'm very enthusiastic about the future of Marion and look forward to working with everyone over the next four years for the good of our town and the future generations that will call it home. Thank you. We have uh, Paul, Kim, and Randy will, all, will be, uh, we'll take the oath of office now. Okay, please your right hand and state your name, I and who are you? Hi, Paul Gray, Mr. You solemnly swear, you solemnly you solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Iowa and the, and the Constitution of the State of Iowa and the ordinances of the City of Marion and the ordinances of the City of Marion and that I will faithfully and impartially to the best of my ability, discharge all the duties of the office of council member. Discharge all the duties of the office of council member in the city of Marion, in the city of Marion, as now or here or hereafter required by law. As now or hereafter required by law. Again, thank you everybody for being here and being part of this special day. Um, we do have our regular work session meeting uh, now, so you're welcome to stay or if you'd like to leave, um, you may do so. Um, thank you again for coming. Thank you, everybody, for your patience uh, in getting the ceremony started today. Okay. Never. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, under public service, we're going to start with number two. This is a discussion regarding our eco-industrial park. This is a project we've been putting together at public service for, oh, probably over a year and a half now. And we've talked uh, with the council about uh, pieces of this project. 
whether it be alternative fuels, uh, new facilities, uh, zero waste, uh, organic technologies, and, and renewable energy. There's a whole gamut of things that goes into this. And um, I, I kind of had a hard time figuring out where to start with this to kind of explain uh, all the stuff we've been working on. But I felt that the best thing to do is start with the simplest things that we've been working on. So the idea of this is not just um, a building, even though we do have facility plans for this, but it is a development that we're putting together. Uh, the idea, and there's some floor plans we've been putting together. Uh, Martin Gardner Architects have, have been uh, working very hard on, on doing that. But the idea of this is to change uh, what we do, uh, at least at, at public service. It's not a facility, it's not a development, it's a, it's a different way of doing things. And that's the idea behind the eco-industrial park. Now, a lot of what we're going to be doing is, is sustainability, whether it be renewable energies, um, recycling, um, a, a lot of the different things under the sun, what we're going to do. So we're going to talk about all that. And, and really what's driving, what, what really drove this was our objectives to be zero waste. Uh, we started down that road a few years back. And uh, we've kind of hit some bumps in the road, hit our heads against the wall many times. But what I can say is that we're a lot further along than what it seems. I promise you that. Now, uh, the Zero Waste International Alliance, you can get certified as a community uh, with them. And probably in the next council meeting, I'm going to ask the council to go ahead and, and pass a motion for us to initiate that. We're going to go ahead and start that. Okay. Uh, to do that, we have to have at least a 90% landfill diversion rate. All right. To this day, no city in uh, the United States has, has reached that. The closest is San Francisco. For San Francisco, sorry, they have an 80% recycling rate. All right, and so, but probably next council meeting we're going to get into this. Uh, we're that far. Uh, we're very comfortable on, on starting this. Okay, and so I think. But the best the best way we're going to start this is we're going to talk about uh, renewable energy, uh, alternative fuels. But I think today we're going to start with organic technologies. And that's the fancy term for compost, uh, of all things. And, and you'll see why we're going to start here. So compost is basically curbside yard waste collection for us uh, that we come out and get to your curb. Or it's what it's left at our drop-off yard waste facility. That could be grass, leaves, yard trimmings, brush, you name it. Okay? Uh, this is something we've, we've come a long ways with, but this is also a, a, one of the foundations we've been working on. And so uh, that's the back of our facility. That's where we process all the yard waste. Uh, we take in 6,000 to 8,000 ton tons of yard waste a year. That's quite a bit, okay? Uh, just for reference, this is how much we've grown. That's a 2010 photo of our yard waste facility. If you look towards the east or towards the uh, right of the TV, uh, that's what it was in 2010. Four years later, that's how much it has grown, okay? So it's grown quite a bit. We're seeing a lot more uh, uh, feedstock coming in. We're, we're processing quite a bit more. Um, and then uh, here's some car count volumes that we're keeping track of. In 2010, uh, our, our peak number during a fall day was about 980 cars. And over the year, we'd see about 9,000 to 10,000 cars come in uh, per, for the year. Uh, now we're seeing about 2,200 cars a day come down there during the fall. And then we see about 24,000 cars annually come through the facility. So that's the volumes really increase there. And so when, when it comes in for us to process, that's what it looks like. You got grass, leaves, all that stuff that's all put together. And we grind it up. We use a big horizontal grinder and we grind it all up and then we uh, process it. And that's the old way we used to process it. We used to pile it up in these big piles and uh, we used to turn it. We used a big end loader to turn it. And uh, it was very inefficient, very costly to do this. And uh, for those who have been on council, a few years back, we bought that compost turner, okay? It's one of the best things we ever bought. And uh, what we're doing now is that we're windrowing all of our feedstock, all right? And by doing that, we're, we're gaining a lot of momentum on, on some of our goals and objectives. First thing, we have lowered our operating costs. It's a lot more efficient to take that turner uh, down. We've used a lot less fuel. Um, only one operator does that. Uh, efficiency, it takes us eight weeks to make compost, about eight weeks, eight to ten weeks, depending on the feedstock, versus six months, all right? That's a big thing for us, because now we have all that, all that feedstock coming in for us, and now we can turn it over a lot quicker. And then also, we're looking at humification practices. That's, that's uh, basically making soil. Uh, we'll get into that real quick. And then biomass diversity. That's our foundation of what we're doing out there. 
And that allows us to be flexible with other things. We can do more with other things, all right? And so we're now it, it has become a science to us. I'm not going to go into this, but the, the science of a windrow is what it is. It is a science, all right? So now we look at our feedstock levels, and we do this for good reason. We look at our carbon and nitrogen feedstock that's coming into our facility. Look at moisture, we look at temperature, we look at carbon dioxide, and we got to keep that fairly low, and our pH level. Um, that's the instrument, some of the instruments we use, we use temperature probes, CO2 meters, things like that. And every year we also test it. We test it a couple times a year. We test it at the beginning of the year, test our feedstock. We test it during the year, and we test it after the year. So we have a lot of testing involved on these feedstocks that are coming in, all right? And we'll get to that, why that's important to us. So what we basically do with composting is we break apart the plant cell, all right? And by breaking apart the plant cell, we, we break it down. And by doing that, we, we basically ma make dead organic material. Uh, with compost, that's exactly what it is. It's dead organic material. Uh, what we're getting into now is humification. And with humification, it's the same process. We're break it, breaking down the plant cells, but we're creating a new polymer protein structure. What humus is is a very rare soil. Uh, about 1% of the soil on Earth is humus. Uh, it's also very expensive. And I did bring some stuff to show you guys. Our compost. So humus, if you get it to that state, it's very rare, it's very uh, rich and organic. Uh, it sells for about $150 a ton, okay? We can call up on the market for the people that we work with and say, hey, you guys need any humus, they'll buy it from us. Uh, they know it, it's very rare. It's very, I wouldn't say it's difficult to make, but it's very time consuming to make, okay? That's one thing that we're working on there. Uh, other thing we're working on is diversified biomass products, all right? When I mean diversified, I mean we're looking at making other products from our biomass. And biomass is just not the yard waste that we're taking in. We're going to get into this. Uh, biomass tea, uh, that's one thing we just began making last year. And that's exactly what it sounds like. This is our tea maker back at Public Service. We can actually take the biomass <coughs> that comes in and we take it into this uh, equipment and we make a organic fertilizer, liquid fertilizer. And it looks, it looks like dirty water. And that's about what it looks like right there. Uh, it's dirty water but it's very valuable uh, when you're done and completed. Um, and if you can go on here, you can buy it. Uh, it is expensive, $70 for a five gallon pail. Um, and the reason why this is uh, very important to us is that we're looking at other things uh, to do with that. Um, in traditional agriculture, if you're, you have an agriculture background, if you're a farmer, you understand what NPK treatment is. That's your soil treatment throughout the, throughout the phase of growing crops. And that's your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium treatments. And uh, during the season, you can spend anywhere to $150 to $200 uh, doing that, those treatments. Um, the people that we work with that we get educated on how to do this, they're Mennonites, okay? And um, they use this and it costs about $2 per acre and that takes the place of your traditional treatments, your NP and K treatments. So you went from $150 to $200 now down to about $2 per acre. Uh, it's very cheap to, to manufacture um, and it's very, very organic. And so. I was a skeptic. I thought it was kind of a cult when I went to class there. We spent about a week with this I Mennonite know. community. And so we did this on our own. These are uh, stuff we did in our own garden. And you can see quite a difference. We treated this with humus tea. And you can see the, the, the difference in the root systems. All right. Same thing here. Uh, these are pepper plants that we pulled out that we grew through the air. And we saw a tremendous difference. And Later on, we'll get into soil science, not, not today, but th this is a big thing of what we're doing. And th these are some of the peppers that we're pulling out of the garden. They are very impressive. Uh, we had a very good year. So um, in addition to that, um, we are looking at taking other biomass products. And this is how it ties back into what we're doing. We have all these projects like with fiber, right, and, and things like that. And That's from Yellowstone Park. And I, I had the opportunity to go out there last year and I've, I've kept in touch with these guys for a long time. 
okay? And out in Yellowstone, they have the same objectives that we do. They want to be zero waste, all right? And I wouldn't say they're ahead of us, but they have a slight advantage to us right now. And this is their compost facility out in Yellowstone. But they do things a little different. They, that's their feedstock, it's garbage. So what you're looking at right now is garbage. Right there, okay? Uh, so out in Yellowstone, they take all the garbage from the park because they want to be zero waste, okay? Same thing, same technology that we use with Fiberite, right? The thing they employ there is a sear drum. That's what it looks like. It's a big drum. I'll show you pictures of it. The purpose of that drum is to get organic separation. The only thing it does is it takes hot water, sprays it on the garbage, it spins it. What comes out is that organic material. And that's, that's similar to what we use. At, I wouldn't say it's similar. Uh, that's a screener. I call it our ancient screener back at public service. That's our old one. There's not much different, difference in the two. Okay, that's the sear drum that they utilize out at West Yellowstone. Uh, they take in about 60 tons a day. That's about twice as much as what we take in, all right? This is the exact same technology that we're utilizing with the Fiberite project, all right? So it's not rocket science. Um, that particular sear drum right there, that was built in 1969, all right? They bought it used in 2003 and installed it. It has been running ever since. It has never broken down. It's a very simple machine that they utilize out there, all right? That's the proposed new one, that right there, that's one of the scientists with Fiberite. And that's basically nothing has changed. It's, it's the same design. They've, they've kind of beef, beefed some of the things up there. But ever since two, 2003, Yellowstone has been running this, this same design. And basically what's going on is that they're taking all the organic material, looks like that, and what happens, they, they kind of spin the garbage, so to speak. So the, the garbage bags break open, and all the paper waste, what we call the organic waste, gets separated, all right? That's what it looks like on the left. That's your cellulose material, all right? So with cellulose material, that's, that's the good stuff. That's what everybody's racing to get, either to make fuel out of it or to make uh, what have you. There's a lot of different things you can do with it. On the right, that's your inorganics. That's your recyclables. And this is our... So that's kind of the key on, on moving forward. So if you look in it, you can see that all the organics kind of get crumpled up together, but you all can see there's plastic elements, there's little things in there that get deposited. And with the inorganics, what I could call the recyclables, those get picked out. And you can take those and sell them on the market if you want to. Same stuff that Fiberite does. But out at Yellowstone, they do things a little different. Uh, here's the machine running, and I got video. If you guys want to come out and see video, I can show it to you. Uh, but here's the machine running, and you can see the cellulose material coming off the machine, and they put it in this mixer, all right? And in this mixer, they, the only thing they want to do out there is make compost, and you can do that. It's, it's great compost. And, but the difference is they, they do a little bit different composting techniques. They do everything inside in vessel composting, not the most efficient, not the best, as you can see. That You can see it, it's gone anaerobic. That's what happens. You get that white fungus on the anaerobic material. And uh, here's some experiments they're doing. You can see the trash in there. They're not sorting that trash. They're, they're just experimenting with it. And so that's at 10 weeks of compost. And so when they're done with it, the only thing they have to do is clean it up. They use what they call an air classifier. Very easy machine to utilize. Um, and uh, hits the air classifier. And what that does, it, it separates the material based on density and volume. It also screens it out. You can see all the um, forks and everything that it screens out. And then with that, after it's done, it becomes a finished uh, organic material. In this case, they sell it for, um, they sell it as compost, you know, for uh, soil enrichment. Uh, but there's other things you can do with that, which we're going to get into uh, down the road, because that cellulose, that material, is a very, very potent uh, feedstock. Uh, you can burn it, you can uh, turn it into fuel, you can do a number of things. And so um, as we move forward, uh, that's kind of understanding we wanted to get to the council. That's kind of the basis of this whole technology. All right, so we're kind of tying everything together on what we're doing. And so um, that's exactly where we started from is our biomass. Uh, there's a reason why we've, we've gone to this type of system and uh, we're, we're further ahead than everybody thinks. Uh, that, that I can promise. And so we are, we are doing a number of things and uh, to get to zero waste, 
we're not far. Uh, we, we're very close. And so we'll probably get into that as we as we go down the road. So I felt that was like probably the best place to start with some of the things we're doing out there. Uh, that's a good basis, a good foundation to understand the next step of where we're going. Because after this, with that biomass, we can make fuel. We can make natural gas. Uh, after that, we can also make other solid fuels. And then with that, uh, we go from there. So any questions? material was actually processed in Marion. That's actually our garbage, so we did that here in Marion. So. Is there a lot of energy that has to go in to be, to make this? None. Uh, the only thing that really, that you see, that, that was a, a full bag of garbage. Um, it's an electric motor that drives it. Um, I believe their electrical cost per month, it had about $40 per month. Um, our electrical rates are probably gonna be different here. Um, and we're testing that right now to see how much energy it takes. But you um, don't have to heat it or anything like no, that? No. Uh, well, the, the water is, they do utilize some hot water, but it's about 10 gallons per batch. It's yeah. not a lot. Oh, that's not much. No, it's not much at all. There's okay. a lot of moisture in solid waste. And so when it starts tumbling around, it does that kind of automatically. That right there, that we didn't add any water into that. It just went, broke apart. So um, it, it's not a difficult thing to do. And when we get into this more, it, it's actually very easy and we're actually a lot closer than what people think. So, um, and we'll get into all that. So, but we felt that it's probably the best place to start right there. It's a good foundation. Good job. Any other questions? So if, when uh, Marion gets going, how much of this do you think we would produce? I, it'd be up to Marion. Um, do we wanna take other waste in? Do we wanna take other people's waste? Uh, do we want to compete with people? Um, we have the capacity to take as much as we want. It's just, it's, it's, it'd be a decision of council of how big you want to make it. Um, and obviously any business partners we got, like Fiberite, people like that, it, it'll be up to them as well. Um, we have changed the scope of that project. We're going to get into that next time. By that time, we should have a firm foundation how that's going to look. Um, but we're, we're very comfortable right now. I guess I'll ask you different. Yep. How much could we make? How much uh, product could we make? Depends on what you want to make. <laughs> uh, when it gets to that state, you can make a number of things. Um, I mean, like tonnage-wise? I'll show you. This This is uh, how you make natural gas out of, the, out of that product, what you see right there. Um, I wish I could say it was difficult. It's not. Um, Fiberite uses a washing machine that's on a cruise line. And when they wash all that stuff, like the residue, they get all that fine stuff out of there, they have to clean it. Well, it takes 600 gallons per ton of solid waste to wash it. That's a lot of water. Yeah. But they recycle it. And the way they recycle it, it's through anaerobic di digestion. And that's where the fuel comes from. That's where the natural gas comes oh. from. It's a very basic system. Uh, another thing um, that we are doing is pellet fuel. Oh. Um, we have a lot of people in this area that are interested in doing that with us. And it's very easy to pelletize that, that material. It has about the, about the same uh, burn characteristics as, as wood, as a wood pellet. Um, and so we're, we're looking at a whole gamut of things right now and very, very close to that. <coughs> so it's taken a little bit to do it. We've had to work with other companies that we didn't foresee working with, but um, that's, that's one of the things we're looking at, so. Well, given that the Jordan Aquifer is sinking or at least running out of water, uh, is this going to affect that? No, um, very little water is used. And it is, it is recycled. Yeah, what water is used is, I'll, I'll back up, and we'll get into this next time, because I don't want to drop everything on, on you guys at once. But when it hits the, the wash cycle, all that water goes through the system, and um, the way they clean it is through a high-rate anaerobic digester. That's on the bottom there. And I, I got pictures of that. And so it's not difficult. Basically, you introduce an enzyme that cleans the water. What happens, it produces a, a methane fuel. They scrub the methane, that becomes renewable natural gas, or ethanol, depends on what you want to make. Uh, natural gas is cheaper to make than ethanol. Um, just where we're at with that process is that we've had to deal with some utility companies. We didn't really foresee them doing that, but, um, but everything's, everything's good, so. Too much, not enough. Any other questions I can answer? <laughs> okay. 
And so what, what I can say, this right here, I'll show you how close we are. This is our garbage. This was processed in the city of Marion and never left the city of Marion. That's how close we are. I can't go any further than that. I need to talk to the city manager first because I didn't, <laughs> wasn't be able to catch up on the winter break to say we had a nice Christmas present come up. And so uh, I, was, I was pretty happy to do this part. This is big because what I can say right here, just with this process, we're at zero waste. And that's why we're going to start the process. Okay? So we'll get into that next time. So everything, Thank you. Everything is good. Okay? So you send a dump truck full of this to Lon's front yard? No. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, no way. So, um, but this is uh, very exciting. I know it, when it came out in the paper, the Eco Industrial I, article, I didn't get a chance to read it, but um, I know there's a lot of stuff of talking about alternative fuels and things like that, but I, I think this is the best place to start. This is the, the backbone of what we're doing. So I think from here, we'll, we'll really get in this branch out. And uh, yeah, it's all coming together. So, yeah. That's amazing. Thank right. you, Ryan. Thank you. And uh, number three, I thought that was start. One thing, um, we had some appointments come and go for our boards and commissions. Um, I did file a memo with the, with the council in terms of the appointments for the Public Services Board. Uh, our staff is uh, requesting that we have our current members, uh, Craig Addison and Kevin Morgan, reappointed. Uh, they've been with us for quite some time. Um, um, if, if the council wants us to look at adding people to our board, we'd be open to that. Um, but that is the, the staff and the board's recommendation. Uh, but if you want to look at other members, we, we will, we'd be happy to, to expand our board. So that's, that's all I got. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you. Is engineering next? Hard act to follow. All right, item number two wasn't starred, but were there any questions on that? That's just the second reading of the ordinance, so it will not go on the consent agenda. You guys will have to actually do that. And if you have a supermajority, you can do wave the third if you want to. I didn't hear what you said, Mike. Uh, is it on? Item number two is uh, ordinance. It's not actually starred, but it's the second reading. That'll be on Thursday. So that will not be on the consent agenda. Okay. So. Is there any problem legal-wise? Have we heard anything about this? I mean, we can... Um, yeah, if it affects three people directly that are developers that are putting the, the road in. This is just access fees for it. So we can suspend on, on this one and pass it for final? Unless Don has a problem with it. As long as you have a sufficient number of uh, council members present. <laughs> yeah. All right, item number three. So you guys previously received the bids. We only received one bid for this project. And so when we went to do the contract, th this had an alternate bid of whether it was wireless or wired. Um, this is for the push buttons um, on Lindale, that lent the, the trail down there that public service put in for us on one side. Then we have the gravel trail on the other side. Um, so during that conversation, it, it was found out that the supplier had only quoted one flashing beacon instead of two. Um, so we worked with the contractor and that's what the change order is. The next item is the change order to add the second beacon in there. Um, because we only had one bid, um, no one else was interested in doing the project. We're suggesting that we accept the contract as it was submitted and then accept the change order adding that additional beacon. And if you look at my memo that still puts us, the original bid was 16769 which is only 60.3% of the engineer's estimate. The change order adds $8,737. So those two combined make it $25,506, which is 91.7% of the engineer's estimate. So that's how staff is recommending we go forward on that. And both the contract and the change order when you're council packet. Was Trey the only one that bid really? Yeah, there's only one bidder on this project. So uh, I sent it out to everybody, but um, some people don't want to tackle, you know, they might be able to put 
a light pull in, but then when it has to do with buttons and configuring things, they, they can't do that. And Trey actually has a specialty guy that he has come in and do it. So like the flashing beacons that we put out on 151, he actually had to have somebody come out and, you know, he wired everything, but then to get it actually to go, he has a traffic signal guy that comes out and does it. So it's going to be push button and not motion. Correct. Yep. So there'd be a button on each side. You'd push the button and both lights would flash. questions on that one the next one f5 and f6 are together this is uh, the 2016 sidewalk ramp project so this is our annual program that we have to do to get our ramps compliant <coughs> so for this project we received five seal bids on the 29th of December we had a low bid of seventy eight thousand ninety dollars and fifty cents for Midwest concrete at 96.1% of the engineer's estimate. There's a late start date of May 2nd of 2016 and 50 working days and $300 in liquidated damages. Any questions on that one? And the bid tab was in your council packet. So we'll have a, a public hearing. Typically on that public hearing, nobody really talks. It's just accepting the, the bids. It's 50, 50 days, that's, is that a little long? For a <laughs> it is, but, and that's kind of why we get a little better prices because this really doesn't affect traffic, so we're not worried how long it takes, and that's why oh. we get a little, a few more bids is because they can come in, they can do an intersection, leave, go do another project, come back and do this one, because this one, if it rained the day before, they could still come out there and pour versus, you know, city street or something. So are we going to have people complaining that their front yard's torn up for 50 days? Um, we haven't in the past. I mean, this the, this particular contract, I mean, we haven't had the pre-construction meeting yet, obviously, but they like to come in, get it done, and get back out. Okay. But we like to leave that flexibility, and also with that working day. So May 2nd, let's say that they already have too many, too much on their books, and they can't do it, and they can't start till later. Well, they're, they're burning those days because we start charging them on May 2nd. And so we've had that before where pipe contractors wait and it's only going to take me 25 days versus 50 days. So they wait till the last 25 days. It's at their risk, but that's an option for them to do. So when I get the call, I'll put you on the speed dial. Sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next one is the art in the alley. So F7 and F8 are combined. Um, so last time, as you guys know, we received one bid, and this won't all fit on there, so we'll try and just get the bottom of it. So we went back to the, the plans and modified them a little bit, and uh, we got three bids this time. Um, so three sealed bids were received on the 22nd of December. A low bid of three hundred and forty-three thousand four hundred sixty-eight and fifteen cents was received from Central States Concrete at one hundred and five point six percent of the engineer's estimate, and that's including the alternate, which is three additional lights that we felt was important. We took them out of the project in case we needed to, but since we are close to what we have budgeted for this, we want to go ahead and get those lights in there so that in that alley we control the lights and they're not on someone's side of someone's building that they could shut the light switch off. Um, so they're just, it's one additional light in the north-south alley on the south half and two in the east-west on the east half. So how much revision was required or how much did you, how much, how downsized is the project? Um, there, we made quite a few changes to it. I mean, we had a meeting with the contractors to figure out, you know, why, why did the numbers come in twice, the engineer's estimate, what can we do to, to get the, the prices better. Um, some of the major aspects I would say that are different from what we had before was before, when you look down the alley, you would see basically two rails, like the railroad, and we actually took that out, that was all going to be brick, and we took that out, instead we put it back in how it is now, so it's, the brick is churned 90 degrees and there's just panels. Um, that was something that we changed just because we had to take items out of it to get it so that it was a better product within the, the budget that we had. So I, I don't know that we took anything drastically away from it that's going to take away from the art. 
and I mean we had several leadership meetings with the committee and everything to to make those decisions it wasn't like I just took well that's too expensive and, and cut it out so as Lon and Amanda can attest we had several meetings so and we we had meetings at Kings that where they put up mocks for us they built a, a mock in the alley for us to look at different alternatives and stuff so a lot of the items that were removed were related to uh, constructability issues. Uh, the original design for it um, had a lot of things in it that really required a lot of active management from the contractor to make sure everybody got in there and sequenced at the same time. Uh, for example, one of them was the original project didn't identify a staging area where they could store materials and store equipment. So when they bid their mobilization costs, they bid it as though they were going to have to bring everything in and take it out every day. Since then, we were able to work with Franz Community and investors and they identified part of the old SORG parking lot that we're going to be able to use as a staging area. So things like that were able to reduce costs. Uh, the electrical system was also simplified quite a bit um, to uh, make it a little easier to, uh, to reduce the number of circuits, make it easier to construct and maintain. Um, we changed the lighting plan um, in to reduce the number of fixtures, things like that, but without really um, doing things that would change the level of lighting across the area. So I don't think it's things that, um, you know, would really impact it as you walk down through there that people are really going to notice, but it made it a lot easier for the contractors to actually get in and build. A There's a lot less handwork. Yeah, I mean, a big part of it is instead of letting it in April, it was letting it in December, January. And so people don't have their books full. And that, that was a big deal. I mean, in April, most contractors already have their season. And that's why we push so hard to get this let now before everybody is busy. And so obviously that makes more of a competitive environment. And we also got some parking at the Presbyterian Church parking lot. So a lot of those little things help out. Uh, let me ask, uh, Lon mentioned mobilization. They all had the same information. That's where the big difference is in the entire bid. Uh, you know, the winner of the bid was 36.5. Rachi was 80,000, and uh, the third one was 100,000. The rest of the bid is pretty close, other than that one. But they all had the same basic information. Yeah, so I can tell you Central States Concrete is a fairly new company, so they have a much smaller footprint. So not to pick on Rachi, but they're a bigger company, and so they have a lot of overhead. So they have administrative assistants. They have people in the office that are doing budgets and everything for them. But they got to pay that person to put the bids together. Where central states, the owner is the one that put it together, and he's going to be the one that's out there doing it. And so his mobilization, he doesn't have as much overhead to manage all the, the subcontractors that would be out there. He's managing them people because he's out there. Okay. Um, so that's part of it. Um, I know one of his subcontractors is Joe Cruiser, which is local, and, you know, tell Joe to go do what he needs to get done and get in and, you know, he has smaller equipment, he doesn't have the big equipment like Rachi has, so. And that was the one thing that came to mind when he asked that question, Paul, is sometimes with the larger contractors like Rickliffs, they may actually have to go out and rent smaller equipment to be able to get into a limited uh, scope area like this, whereas some of the other ones may have that just as part of their regular fleet. Yeah, it was just such a big difference. They're at 100,000 compared to 36, you know. That's and it, it, it all kind of depends, too, on where they put it. They know that that mobilization number, they're going to get all of that. They're going to get 100% of that value versus something else. Let's say that there's some drain tile we decide not to put in. Well, we pay by the lineal foot on drain tile. So if we take out 20 foot, they don't get paid for that 20 foot. So it depends, too, on where they put their profits. You know, they might put lower price on all their unit prices and then bump up their mobilization. It just, that's the game that they play. Is the lighting plan there? Is that high efficiency lighting, LED lighting? I believe it's LEDs, yeah. And is that on a Marion, City of Marion meter? Yeah, it'll be on a meter for us. Is it on every day, like a street light type thing? or We have it switched for several different scenarios. So it also controls what the artist's light sculptures that are going to be back there that include light. But we have a control panel where we can switch it. Let's say there's an event back there, and we have a band, and we want to power that up. We can open up the cabinet and turn that on. Okay. So there's different options for when we have things on. So it's not full brilliance all night? And no. Okay. 
when do you expect work to begin then? So I would expect, you know, once the winter's gone, they would start in there again. We have to have a pre-construction meeting first. But what we put, did there is we put a completion date of October 28th and $1,500 per day in liquidated damages. So they know when that has to be done. It's up to them to know their workflow and how quickly do we need to get in there and get stuff done. And that way it gives it time for the artists then to come in and get their sculptures. So with this, what, what's the total cost of the project approximately? Um, do you know what the artist total is? Now it's, right now we're estimating around 900,000 and that includes all the art installations as well. So to date, um, there's been f about 516,000 fundraised for the project. Does that include the grant? Including the grant, yep, 166,000 locally. Okay. Any other questions? So item number nine is also somewhat related to this. Um, early on we had a discussion of part of the aesthetics with the alley is you had all the overhead utilities back there. And so we presented three options to council, leaving them as is, um, taking them down, only the services, or actually um, burying everything and then coming up the sides of the buildings. So this is just the alliant map of the alley. And so those red lines, those are the overhead lines that are back there now that'll go, that'll go away. And so, um, so far I've got Mediacom's full numbers, which is here in the packet, that's the the $4,898.51, which is $200 higher than their preliminary estimate they gave us last year. And then an item for Thursday, I got Alliance. Theirs is a little higher. I think theirs came in 13000 higher. And that was due to them estimating what it was going to cost to run the conduits up the side of the building. And they just kind of estimated that internally. They didn't actually go get quotes. And so they actually went out and got quotes, and that's why it's higher. Um, it's actually ESCO Electric that is going to be doing the work on that. Um, but those items are all kind of linked together as part of the, the project. So there's there's Mediacom, Alliant, and Imon that's all going to be buried. Um, the gas company is already buried back there. Um, and that's just part of the aesthetics of the project. It really cleans the project up. It allows us to put the sculptures that we want to put up and not detract from those. Well, did this include that they were putting a big transformer or something back there too? Yeah, so basically right up in here is where we're putting the stage. And there's a wall that goes on the north side of that stage. And behind that, that's where our transformer's going. That's where the cabinet's going. And so there's, there's one pole that'll stay here and everything will go underground from here and then branch off to its different directions. So it'll be hidden behind this artist wall. But yeah, there, there has to be a transformer and all that for it to go right. underground. So that's part of this, what is it, 60, almost $70,000? Yep. yep, and some of that is um, they provide the conduit for us, and then when we tear the entire alley out, our contractor is going to bury it. And so that was included in that bid. Oh, so all they have to the do line. is pull the wires through then? Right, okay. and that way they can have, you know, they can get all the, the conduit in that they need to have in. We can pour the concrete, and then the utility comes in and just puts everything in the conduit. They don't mix up the three phase with the media com. <laughs> and I, I think uh, IMONS is one of the lowest numbers. We don't have their official number yet, but I, I it was only a, a couple thousand dollars, I believe, for theirs. Any questions on that? The next item is a motion to receive and file correspondence regarding a request for review of a speed limit on West 29th Avenue between Albernet and 10th Street. Um, we're, I have a pretty long memo that I gave you guys in your council packet. We're not recommending this go to TAC. We've looked at this item 
several times. There's signs that's posted 25 miles per hour when kids are present. Um, it's a major arterial, um, so we can't just lower the speed limit because then what that's going to do is it's going to cause more congestion, and then those people are going to start driving through the residential streets instead of the major arterial. Um, and that's just that's what that road. That's why there's not driveways on 29th Avenue because of the access control, and that's why it's a higher speed limit except for in the school section. Um, we've made hybrid the that hybrid beacon. We put that in there. We took that crosswalk out that was west of the school entrance. Um, so we have a set of hybrid beacons that we added over here. Some of the issues they were having before is the kids and the turning traffic were having issues at 4th and 29th. So we actually took that island out and moved the kids crossing over here, with the cross guard and the, the flashing beacons. That way we kind of separate the turning movements and the kids crossing. And that's helped. Um, we haven't heard any complaints from the school district that they're having any issues. If it's purely a speed issue, I'm sure our police department can do some enforcement and take care of that. But we're not recommending that we look into it. Um, that, that's what that street is, is for. So. Would it help if the school, put, put your picture back, you know, if the school put a sidewalk like right where that B is between the, the right here. No, no, between the, where the B is and then the the one coming down to the school. Instead of having to go all the way up to the drive, you know, is there a shortcut they could put in there? Yeah, they could. I guess I don't know where their main entrance is. I mean, they could add a sidewalk in here. Yeah, that's typically as you know, like on 10th Street when we put the sidewalk in last year. If kids are taking that path, there's going to be a cattle path that's right. built, and I don't really see one from that. No, image. you're right. So I, if they must not be taking it. There must be a different entrance that they're yeah. using or something. Yeah, the main entrance on that one, Mike, is would be down below where the NTS is on the map. Yeah, it looks like they're going side. straight. See over here to the right. That's that's where it looks like they're going. Now over over here, the, the, to I'm my right. My page cuts off. But your left. If there is a shorter distance, they'll find it. Well, it looks like they're coming straight out of the thing going down to the. Yeah. Really? So they, they, they go down the sidewalk to the front door. I'm just, I mean, we don't have any control over that, but that just. No, and, and it's just the school hasn't had any, they don't have a problem coming to us and saying if there's an no. issue with a, a crossing or anything. Okay. All right. Item 11. Sidewalk Advis Advisory Committee. Um, so this was previously, Cody Crawford was on this, and with him moving out of the, the city, um, has left that vacancy. Um, typically, we like to have a member on there. <laughs> Do you want to hear that? Yeah. I think we have a volunteer. A volunteer. All right. <laughs> so we can put an appointment on for Thursday then. Anybody else interested? No? It's only one meeting. <laughs> All right. Next one is item 12. So we typically bring... Uh, together the the list of HMA projects for you guys to review before we put the plans together. Um, this year, I some of the stuff that we're doing with GIS is we're actually working on our inventory of our streets. So I was able to add the past history of the streets, so you can see when we actually built the street. So, for example, Fifth Street from 29th Avenue, 300 foot north, it was paved in 1970. And we put the first overlay in 1997 on that section. It's just a short section there. And so now we're doing it again, where we'll mill the HMA off and put it back down. Um, South 14th, it was actually done in a couple different sections between 1959. There was another one in 1961. Um, some of that was HMA uh, anywhere from 95 to 1971. So I, I won't go through and read all those to you, but um, I put those on there. There are two streets 
uh, 26th Street and 4th Avenue that are still concrete from 1975 and 1960. And so those actually have no HMA on them, but the joints are just getting so deteriorated that we need to make that a smoother ride. So that's what the HMA is, putting a Band-Aid on it until eventually we'll have to reconstruct the street. But um, typically on an HMA overlay, you get, you try and get at least 20 years out of it. So you can see we've been kind of pushing those. So um, the last time they were overlaid was before I was born. <laughs> so, um, so this is our, our program. If you guys have any questions or. I have a question for staff, one of those is right in front of my house, is my street. Am I able to vote on, or is this? Nobody has questions for you. Well, I'm <laughs> not. Oh, it needs to be done, but is it conflict of interest? Generally, with something like that, I mean, you're voting on an entire slate of projects mm -hmm. for the city. It's not a case where you're going to benefit from anything financially. And in this case, as a newly seated council member, this was well underway before you uh, were seated on the city council. Okay. This, this was actually from a larger list that I had to pare down to fit it within the budget, so. Okay. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Um, F14 and F15 are just receive uh, resolutions accepting subdivisions. So the developer has built the subdivision and uh, now we're accepting it so we get to maintain it. So. And then there was a a last minute receive and file um, that will refer to TAC. That's number 15. They want to change the yield sign to a stop sign. So. Anything else? Any questions? Thank you. All right, thank you. The first item uh, started under planning and development um, is, is regarding a retaining wall to be located on 8th Avenue um, in front of John and Kelly Kennan Lane's uh, property. There was quite a detailed site plan and information. It's a pretty standard procedure. Anytime we encroach into the city right away, we need to have an agreement. Um, I wasn't going to go into any great detail unless there's a desire by the council if there's questions. Um, the lane, uh, the Kelly Kinnan Lane has been very active with the urban chickens, and I don't know if you noticed in that she's proposing, which is kind of interesting, to create an edible garden in the landscape adjacent to that wall. It's on the site plan, so it's kind of an interesting concept. So it kind of falls in line with our blue zones and urban agriculture uh, ordinance that was recently adopted. Um, the next item that would start, unless there's questions. Yes. The you had the examples of the retaining wall. Is that ones that they had given to you, or is that ones you recommended to them? No, that was what they've given to us. Is like examples, and I and I, the one illustration where it showed it was a, like a limestone wall. The thing that they're trying to get away from is that grass strip between the wall and the sidewalk. It wasn't the limestone wall. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's that's their recommendation to get away from that. And yeah, they don't want to have that. They want so they want to be able to encroach to provide the wall right up adjacent to the sidewalk. Yeah, okay. Yep. Thanks. Yep, no problem. But it's just to be clear, it's their wall, and they're putting up the wall. Correct. They're just yep. asking for an encroachment. Exactly. Yep, to be in on city okay. right. Okay, just so yep. everybody's clear. Yep, exactly. Okay. Um, the next item, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Dave to uh, um, kind of present on. I know there were questions at the last meeting regarding the demolition for the garage structure at the 1190. <laughs> Ninth Avenue, um, Mr. Draper, you had some questions on that. It's our demolition expert here. So I brought in the <laughs> the big hitter here. Uh, <laughs> big hitter. Huh? Dave carries a big sledgehammer. Uh, not much voice today either. So <laughs> sorry. provided an update in the staff report trying to address Mr. Draper's question from a few weeks ago. Uh, this is the subject garage on the north side of the house. It's a post-1930s addition to the home. Um, I think the question came up is, do we have to notify somebody if we're removing part of a structure from a, from a historic home? 
uh, like the, the National Register? Uh, the answer to that question is no, we, we're not required to. I do provide an update to the state every year. My report's due in February this year for last year, and I do provide updates of demolitions, structures moved, et cetera, that are with our three historic districts. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission, they did recommend approval as it was not uh, essential to the character and historical value of this house. They had no objection to the, the removal of the property. So again, we, we will notify the state. It does not affect the status because it's not individually eligible. Um, as is was Mr. Noska's old house, Judy Potter's old homes, uh, those are or the Presbyterian Church. Those are standalone historic properties. This house here is not standalone historical uh, in terms of the national context, but it does contribute to the, the historical value of the neighborhood. So yes, it's a very important historical home for the district, but it's not necessarily recognized nationally on its own merit. Again, so we don't, we're not required to notify for any changes, demoing, et cetera, but we do as a, uh, as a uh, just to keep the files updated. Um, if the house was to be torn down, you could, it could result in the altering of the district boundaries, uh, but again, a minor removal like this is not something that's gonna affect that boundary either, so. Any questions? <coughs> what they proposing a more modern looking garage no they're actually proposing well, a larger garage um, uh, hip to roof obviously to get the to deal with the water problems they're having with the house uh, it's a flat roof there now and uh, it's a slightly larger garage uh, they're proposing it to be attached uh, they're having some issues with the zoning board right now they're, they're trying to work through to get it approved um, but it'll be a barely a two stall garage there's a lot of uh, stairs inside that garage that actually go down to a cellar. The old cellar door used to be on that back side. So there's actually garage, there's actually steps from the house down and into the cellar down. So it's kind of a lot of that garage is actually eaten up by stairs. Uh, so it'd be a, I'll call it a small two stalls what's being proposed. Do we but they've got some setback issues. Do we know if they do not get approval for this new garage, if they're still going to tear that down? Um, it's kind of come down one way or another. Uh, with approval or without, I mean, it's 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 causing quite a bit of damage to the house. It's starting to slip away from the house, so uh, it, it needs to be dealt with. So, I think they got options. They can build a detached garage on the on the property and probably meet most most code. I think it's just their desire to have it attached for obvious reasons. Right. So, we're not adding to the house itself. It's a just one, a garage, one story garage. Correct. Could you tell me who the owner of that property is? Uh, Joe Ward is the current owner of the property. Thank you. I hope, Paul, I addressed your, I address your questions for a few weeks uh, you, ago. You've so. answered my question. Okay. I just, I knew it was in the district, and uh, I know there are some restrictions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. This, is, this is the second one in this district. We actually tore down part of an old house, uh, the back end, uh, five years ago. They rebuilt that pretty uh, pretty nice compared to the neighborhood. We've done a few other approvals in the past, so uh, luckily we're just doing a little minor, we're tearing off modern additions to these homes, uh, and they're actually being rebuilt a little bit better and a little bit uh, more sensitive than some of the original additions, so. Yeah, I mean, we have some homes on 8th Avenue. Uh, the Vossler House, yeah. as an example, beautiful two-story house that used to have a front porch on it, yep. uh, you know, and <coughs> hopefully as we, particularly in that district, uh, do work on those homes that we're able to keep the splendor of their yep. architecture. Yeah, and I, I should point out, I mean, especially for the newer members, I mean, our districts, we do not have any protection other than demolition uh, protection. Uh, you can tear off your front, well, you can't tear off, you can't tear off your front porch as part of demolition, but you can paint your house pink. You can come on and put a uh, big old addition on it, all glass windows, very modern looking. You can do that without any uh, special approval. That was kind of a, a deal we worked out many years ago to get these, to create these districts with some reluctant homeowners. Um, granted, that was, some of these are almost 15 years old. So um, again, you can, you can pretty much do whatever you want to your house. Minus tearing something down, so. That's something that could be addressed in the 
update or the comprehensive plan that you're yeah, going to yeah. be working on soon? Yeah, you know, the current <laughs> comprehensive plan does does address the historic districts uh, uh, with yeah. a paragraph, and it basically says, you know, it, it says encourage. A lot of shoulds, not a lot of shalls, um, to proper um, uh, proper maintenance of a historic home. Um, it, it's just a matter of if the council wants to turn those shoulds into shalls, uh, that's, that's a big step. Uh, the problem is last, when we were first talking about it 15 years ago when I started, uh, Cedar Rapids was actually taking all those standards out of their districts because they were causing so many problems and a lot of interpretation issues. So uh, the council then decided we don't want, we don't want to get tangled up in that, and so we didn't. But we can always revisit it if the council wants, but uh, so far we've been pretty good at encouraging, uh, encouraging them and giving them the shoulds rather than the shall. So. I mean, we may we've been lucky so far too, but <coughs> thank you. Kesha, did you have a microphone? Is it off? There you go. Thank that. Dave turned it off on me. Um, so I'm here to discuss what item was it? Seven. Seven. And regarding an application to the Corridor Metropolitan Planning Organization, also known as the CMPO. The CMPO is responsible for bringing in or controlling the uh, federal dollars that the metro area gets as a whole. And so what happened in going to do a brief refresher for those of you that have gone through this spiel. I'm going to go through it again. Um, in 2012, the CMPO, the policy board of the CMPO opted to take the approximately $5 million that we get every year and split that 80% towards trails and 20% towards roads. So this is a big increase in trail funding. And since then, the city of Marion has applied three times um, in four grant cycles and been successful three times and getting a significant amount of funding for those. Um, and this is the last year of that 20% or 80% towards trails. So it's approximately $4 million that is available for trail funding in the metro area. So that's Cedar Rapids, Hiawatha, Robbins, um, Fairfax, now Palo as well. Um, so with that, what we've brought forward is we took this to our Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee uh, looking at of all the trail options that we could do. We looked at our master trails plan that was adopted in 2014 of all the options, what should we do? Uh, they recommended side paths along 10th Avenue. So 10th Avenue, business 151 between Hy-Vee and Walmart. And so that's a pretty rural cross section. There's no curb, uh, no gutter in there, but there are a significant number of bus stops along that route. There's gravel shoulders right now and sometimes a lot of times you will see people either walking or biking on those shoulders in inclement weather, which um, is not desirable. Uh, the BPAC wanted to try and get away from that if possible. And so they recommended to the city council that we look into submitting a grant in 2016 to the CMPO for side paths along 10th Avenue to be both sides of 10th Avenue. That was in November that I came to the council, discussed this, yep, Council wanted to go forward with uh, looking into cost estimates, so we hired Shoemaker Holland in December to give us a, a good engineering estimate. It's, it's not quite final design or preliminary design of this, but they did take into account um, where the culverts are, where the storm sewer would need to be. Um, the cost estimates go in detail as far as uh, ADA upgrades to a lot of the stoplights that would need to happen. Um, it, they took into account some decorative fencing if that would need to be, if that was part of an agreement with a property owner as well. Um, also lighting, if trail lighting would be desired. So this is a, a higher estimate. This allows us to come in with a full gamut of what we would want should we get funded. Um, it would be the high end would be that 2.8 and we'd have the ability to scale back from there. Um, in this would be the funds would be available in 2020 for this project. So it's not like it's going to happen next year. We have to wait those four years to actually get the funding. 
um, hire engineers and then get the construction done. All of this project is within the city right away and so we wouldn't be looking at getting any type of private property. Um, there's a decent amount of city right away in this area. I'm sure you don't have any current renderings of what this might look like or do you? I have page by page. <laughs> oh. um, I don't have an overall yeah. um, an overall high V to um, high V to Walmart scenario, but what we what we'd start at is um, this is the intersection of 35th Street and 10th Avenue. So on the north side is high V, on the south side is the vacant lot next to Mercy Care. And so what it does is it starts since it's a federal grant, it's 10 foot wide side path as a requirement. Um, sometimes they would they would give an allowance for an eight foot where it's deemed um, structurally <laughs> necessary to do that. They don't like to hand out um, allowances like that. But so it'd pick up where there's side path, uh, where the CVS is, there's eight foot side path on the north and the south side. So that'd pick up on the south side. And then to avoid this intersection, we just direct <coughs> pedestrian south and then to the west on both sides. Um, in all of the, in all of the areas, so this would be um, the stoplight, so this would be Mercy Care, and then the stoplight going into High V there. Again, you can see we tried to tuck it back closer to the, closer to the right of way line, the far outside the road. Again, that, that may have been a higher cost option. We have the complete option to move it closer to the road at the time comes. This is, this, these renderings are meant for construction estimates only. This does not commit us to this alignment exactly. Our commitment is from 35th Street to Eagle View Drive. That's, that's the commitment that we're getting into. Um, whether or not we have lights along the trail, whether or not we um, have any type of decorative fence, you know, any amenities that we could put in there but could do without. That's something that we determine at that time, but we're trying to get an estimate that will meet our needs. We don't want to be underfunded. What about the bridge over Squaw Creek? There is, there is a, Squaw Creek is right um, there. Squaw Creek will be an extension of This is a mobile home park on the south side. So where Squaw Creek comes through, you'd be looking at, so you're, we're trying to keep it as close to the right of way line as possible. But then once it gets up to Squaw Creek, I believe that they are, they're just pointing out the box culverts there, but um, the idea is to bring it up a little bit closer to the road to avoid extending the box culverts any further. So no bridge would be required. Okay. It's all taken care of with storm sewer and culverts. Okay, thank you. And then there's also another culvert um, uh, by Aldi <coughs> underneath 50th Street and then underneath Highway 100 as well. That that again um, was again picked up, put closer to the road in those circumstances and then taken that closer to the right of way line where possible. And again, this is this is just kind of a an idea of how it would lay out in 2020 when we'd get the funds, then we'd hire the engineers, then we go through full review of is this completely possible? Right now we you know we've had good engineering look at, at what it takes, but this by no means commits us to this exact uh, curve on that sidewalk or anything. The uh, individual, the private drives that you go across, do those have to have ADA compliant type? Yes, they they looked at those as well. The cross slope on those would mm -hmm. have to be ADA compliant. They do. So that was they they did go out there and look and take some take some measurements. You know, again, we weren't asking for full in depth review. We didn't have field <coughs> surveys done of every of the whole trail system, but um, they did look at those, take those into account, figure out how far back you, know, you would technically need to take any additional paving to make that cross slope work. 
We would have to provide matching funds? Yes. So the match on this is, it's a pretty good, <laughs> pretty good grant because um, the city needs to commit to 20% of the grant. And so it's about a $2.8 million project, and that is 2020 funds. It's about 2.2 in today's funds. It's a 5% inflation of what the, what the DOT allows or stipulates to be provided. So 2020 cost is estimated at 2.8, and so our financial contribution to that, that 20%, is $567,200. And that is if the project is at full cost. Like I said, we, we asked for more than, we, than hopefully we need, um, but if it comes in at less, then we could, then we could always scale back on that, and we're only responsible for 20%. Okay. Is the Lynn County CMPO, are they looking at any funding on this? Uh, the, is that the right term for it, CMPO? Correct. Yep. Yeah. That's, they, that's where the, that's the application will go in, and they'd be the one providing the 80%. Oh, so they're the application yeah. for the, Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep. Okay. So, but will they put up any money? I mean, you know, that's a, an organization that funds these type things. Will they put up any of the money themselves? That, is that's what the application's for. Right. Yeah. We yeah. Money the coming to the CMPO, to the CMPO. And we're applying for it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's the federal dollars that come into the region for transportation purposes. Okay. So this has been where we've been very successful in our trail plan, trail planning, and, and much of the work been done by Kesha to, to get the appropriate information to them and kind of set the stage for where we can get these trail funds. Okay. Where would, could you clarify the destination for that sidewalk then? Was that all the way to Walmart? Yes. Okay. And so the very last page I have in here shows how it would come. Um, so this is the Casey's on the north side and then Walmart's detention basin. So this is the lit intersection. What we'll be looking at is crossing and then keeping this crossing signal right here. We're trying to deter crossings on both sides at that size of an intersection. And so it would just cross to this sidewalk and then cross to this sidewalk both going north and south. And what is the distance between the sidewalk and um, 151 there at its narrowest point right there? Between? Um, be to your bottom left-hand side there and to the left. So I'll be on the Walmart side. There we go. Okay. So what is the distance? Um, I'm just curious as to how close that sidewalk is to the highway there. And that and that is something that we look at with further review. This was, I believe, I think the reason it was shifted up was because of this storm. Yeah, there's a lot of water retention ponds in that area. Right. I was just yeah, and there's potential for wetlands too. And that sure. Is I mean, is that obviously that. that's not to scale, but I mean, are we talking five feet, two feet, six feet? Um, yeah, I don't see a scale. Uh, it scales. Right scales clear up on the north side. I was going to ask you, Mary. I, would, I, would I would guess it's about. And that's okay. I was just, yeah. I was just curious no, if you knew. Looking at you the scale, it it's, it's five or less. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, well, so what kind of timeline? So you apply for this grant, and yep. then. And in order to receive... When do we find out? I'm sorry. When would we find out? So um, everybody in the metro area submits um, this Friday. The grants are due. Oh. Um, so we would submit staff, uh, kind of puts them into figures as far as what the ask is, what the total ask is, you know, how everything ranks in there. Um, and then usually the first site that the technical advisory committee would have at this was probably... Um, March, April. The final decision doesn't go to the DOT until the middle of July. And so the CMPO board signs off on it. It goes to the DOT. The DOT signs off on it, sends it to Federal Highway. So. Okay. And then, Lon, so then, then the match is budgeted in at some point? In, in 2020. For 2020. Yep. So you have plenty of time to plan for it. And how, how close... There's a trail that's south of there that goes by Ed Reed's property. You know where I am. And that trail eventually goes down on the old, goes out across the highway. How close does that come to Walmart? I mean, it's got to be, can't be that far away from. Well, Walmart, so 
so the north side of Walmart, Walmart takes up about a 40 acre parcel by itself. So the north side of Walmart, it's gonna be at least a quarter mile to the south property line of Walmart and then extending beyond that. Right, but that trail is going to go over there south of 10th or 7th Avenue, whatever you wanna call it. Mm -hmm. Kind of behind those buildings that I think Ed Reed owns. Which yep. isn't very far from Walmart. Right, it's on the opposite side yeah. of the. Is there any way park. that, if this thing done, was any way that could be utilized? Uh, and that would be, you know, the so we have trail down 35th Street. So right. continuing south from here, we'd have trail connect, trail connecting both of those or sidewalk at least, um, and then your next opportunity to get that connection made would be 44th Street, everything so else in there. behind the mobile home park along mm -hmm. the old railroad right away. Yeah. Yep. And then it kind of bends back up north a little bit and goes. Right, right. So that would be another way to get pretty close anyway to Walmart, I think. Right, it, it's just missing the transit. The transit traffic, <laughs> the, the transit okay. users. Um, and any commercial traffic that would be going in between. Okay. This is why one of the trails that ranks higher is because it does um, go right past residential properties, the mobile home parks. Um, it connects, you know, gas stations, grocery stores, all of the above. Yeah, I was just thinking if, if this thing didn't work, if you had the trail on the north side of 10th, you maybe could figure out how to incorporate that. Yep. Southside trail from the, especially the mobile home park, which a lot of the people are coming from, could hop on that trail on the old railroad right away and go to Walmart. Mm -hmm. so. Any other questions of staff? Thank you. Joe, you have a question on number eight? Yeah, I had a question for uh, number eight, Tom. You you had uh, Tim recommended uh, Tim. Maybe, Correct. Uh, I see that he's left, so now I can talk about him. But I see Mr. <laughs> back there. So <laughs> I asked I'll him have to, to stay watch what I now. say. <laughs> but uh, you know, I don't have a problem. I mean, Tim's done a great job on it and everything. Mm -hmm. But I I would like you guys to consider rotating people like contractors or builders on this committee. I know Tim's been on it for many many years. And, you know, I would like to see that this gets rotated. You know, I, I don't have a problem with Tim being on it again, but mm -hmm. uh, I think that I think that, that ought to be, yeah, it shouldn't be a one person on there all the time. Yeah, we don't have uh, term limits, are not a part of any of our committee organizations. So like the zoning board of adjustment members, I think a couple have been on there longer than I've been alive. Right. Um, <laughs> Um, so that's, uh, there's a few of them that have been on for quite some time. Right. Um, you know, that would be a council, a, a directive and as, as, a, as a part of the reappointment, that's why the reappointments are there. Um, you know, we have been doing something a little different lately and that is announcing that there's uh, positions available and taking applications. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, um, something that we've looked at and I think the council receives those as we move yeah, forward. Yeah, so I just that, think that. Yep. Having a single person on this committee for for a long, long time is sure. probably something we shouldn't be doing. Yep. So then, no problem with what Tim's doing. So you can tell him I didn't talk about him, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I have a problem with this, and that is because he is so involved with that land, uh, ex Etzel Farm, uh, the uh, uh, on Tower Terrace, and I do have a problem with that because it is a perceived conflict of interest. And usually if it's perceived, there is some question there. And rather than enter into any kind of litigation, if somebody got a hold of that and wanted to uh, I, looking at my lawyer over here <laughs> saying, Rah. but I, I have a problem with him staying on that committee. That That's not my intent. My intent is just <laughs> no, you didn't ju jump in on this. This is me. Okay. Uh, okay. My intent is to have some, you know, have a fresh face on this, you know. Every now and again. Yes. Yep. Yes. No, that's so. Well, perhaps term limits on committees should be considered. 
and and for example the parks committee they should not be paid if, if they're going to be paid their name should be on a ballot well I'm, I'm not opposed to rotating the positions um, I will say that um, having been on that on the planning and zoning for well, seven or eight years there is some benefit to having continuity mm -hmm. um, you know because knowing what what you did in the past and how things were handled and and kind of having that continuity of the, the whole development um, picture mm -hmm. for the city and the, uh, um, I'm not opposed to rotating there's nothing wrong with that um, but there is some you know and I don't know how long is long enough yeah you know. I just wanted to point that out and um, also Tim obviously was on there at the time that I was on there and I you know I I think any time that there was anything that involved him, he he didn't vote. He he, he even himself. went down and sat in the seats to not have any perception of yeah. of uh, of conflict. So he took care of whatever conflict there was, um, and that's the important part. But you know, again, people can have their opinions, and and I'm not opposed to rotating it. Yeah. Well, the thing that bothers me is it puts him in a position to know in advance of what's going on. <coughs> Um, I well, I would hate to cast any aspersions insofar as knowing where Tower Terrace was going to go, and then going out and buying the actual property. No, now, that, th that, that none of that information is divulged uh, before it goes to as a public meeting. All of that, all that information. Regional is, planning. They're all public meetings. Okay, but th somebody puts two and two together, and they come up with you know. Four and it's not three and a half or three seventy five. It's yeah. and it, well, it gives them an advantage. That's what I'm complaining about. And it, it then it's not open. Yeah, and well. like I said, there's a perception of conflict of interest. Okay. So, so was your that's question it. answered? Yep. If I might, Nick, um, yep. the uh, uh, Joe, some of your argument, having served on. Civil Service Committee for 26 years, um, you do gain a certain amount of expertise in what you're doing, and I think there's advantages maybe of having people know, you know, how to how to handle certain items, and mm -hmm. so I I think there's some advantage in experience on, on some of these committees. So I you know I'd speak in favor of that. Uh, you know the. Civil Service Commission was never worried about a conflict of interest, but uh, oh, yeah. as far as serving a, a good length of time on a committee, there are some advantages as well. And conflict of interest is not anything what I why I brought it up at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you can tell him that <laughs> that's not the that's not the issue. I just think that uh, you know I think that you know if somebody is in the business, you know they think that it needs to be rotated shared or whatever and you know I mean we get we come and go on this this board so uh, you know you may not like it but that's the way it works so we're not appointed no but but I mean there is a difference we come on here you know I was totally green when I came on what were you ever I know <laughs> but uh, so I I wouldn't let the being green deter you <laughs> You know, I, uh, as far as the park board being paid, uh, you know, when we, they were elected and were paid the stipend that they get, and we uh, took the election away and we named that park board, and uh, I would leave that at some point up to the park board to maybe, I don't think anybody on there is on there because they're getting $500 a year. No. Uh, I know that some of that money is returned to the Park Board Foundation. And uh, you could plant the seed and let the Park Board make their own decision and say, hey, you know, we're the only board that's getting paid and maybe we ought to do something. Let them, I'd like to have them decide if that's what they'd like to do. Uh, none of them are there because they're making $500 a year. 
On the other, um, there was another reason why that was left in place as well. Is because um, at the time, uh, Charlie Crest, who was the uh, city's representative to the Solid Waste Agency, the Solid Waste Agency's rules for board members require that their board member be a paid official of the City of Marion. So at the time, park board members, city council members, and city staff were the only ones that were eligible. He was on both boards, so to maintain his eligibility, the park board was uh, left as paid positions. Otherwise he would have had to come off the solid waste agency board as well and someone else would have had to be appointed is that still the rule that's still the rule uh, I think we have some other alternatives we can take out as a look with that but at the time when we were making the change going from three to five uh, the council at the time just didn't want to monkey with it okay thank you Mayor. ready Lon Yep. Uh, item number one under administration is a proposed resolution uh, for a request for funds for the winter light project. Uh, for the benefit of the new council members, um, the Marion Leadership in Action program was started after the Imaginate process was completed in 2009. One of the uh, initiatives that came out of there was that uh, Marion should look at establishing our own in-house leadership program uh, similar to Leadership for Five Seasons down in Cedar Rapids. And that was coordinated and put together through the chamber. One of the things that they do uh, every year with their class is a service project, a combination of fundraising and and uh, putting together a project. In the past, they have done uh, holiday light projects. They have done banner projects. Uh, council uh, saw the banner project proposal that came in from them last year. And uh, this group, the 2016 project, they are proposing to do a winter light project, and they are seeking donations for that. Uh, in the past, the city has made donations to that. Um, we have done it uh, both out of hotel motel and out of uh, local option sales tax from the Imaginate uh, Challenge money that was put together for the, uh, or put into the spending plan for the original local option sales tax. Uh, we didn't put any dollar amount or anything in here because we really haven't had a chance to have much conversation about it. I know uh, Jill is here if uh, you wanted to hear some more detail about what it is that they've got planned. Okay. Hi everyone, I guess I would just answer any questions that you have they're going to this this year they're going to continue um, it's called Operation Snowflake they've renamed it it's the winter lights program that they did a couple of years ago that funded the lights that go around the banners on 6th Avenue they would like to um, continue those on some of the main thoroughfares on South 11th Street and North 10th Street potentially eventually um, Tower Terrace Road and 35th but we would work with Ryan at Public Service, who's been really good to work with on getting the lights put up and the banners put up and taken down um, to make sure that the engineering is right and could handle the wind out on, on some of those northern um, thoroughfares. So we've sent our letter out to the business community. That's how we do it every year, to solicit funds. And then um, the class would actually come back to you guys and ask for a match um, of, of whatever they raise within the business community. Last year for banners, the class raised a little over um, $9,000, which was the best year that they've had so far. Uh, we're in our fifth year of Marion Leadership in Action this year. So um, they, they adopted the program initially because the light poles were up and they had the banner holders on them with no banners. And um, you've probably seen the new banners that we um, did last year that are on 6th Avenue, South 11th. Um, we've got them to go up on North 10th Street, 35th and Tower Terrace, um, and you'll probably see those next spring, I would imagine. Um, but now we're, again, back on the, the lighting kick. So um, when winter comes around, we have something that um, just adds beautification to Marion and makes it more welcome and inviting to residents and visitors. There are a bunch on North 10th. Yes, the banners. Yeah. yeah. They are. Good. Good. Yeah. Oh, and Boyson Road, too. They'll cover Boyson. Maybe a different subject. Jill, who did the circles, the lighted circles? Yeah. So Uptown did that um, because they just wanted to, again, add some beautification before we're going through the streetscaping process. Um, Kara Ulrich 
from Synergy Metalworks. Um, she's a Marian artist, um, actually did those for us, and she basically did them for us at cost. So it was a very affordable project to do quickly. It looked very nice. Thank you. Thanks. I'll pass that along to Ashley. Any questions for Joe? All right. Thank Thanks. you. So I think what we'll do in light of the fact that they don't have their fundraising yet, this will not show up for Thursday, and we'll wait to see how they do with their fundraising, and then they'd come back and make a formal request. Uh, number nine, uh, needed to have a discussion with the... Pardon me a minute, Ron. Yeah. I, I have something I'd like to say about number seven. It's on our agenda. It's not starred. I have wrestled with this. I've been peed off more than anything in the world. And we all have a letter from Medco explaining what our suburb to the west did to us. And that isn't the first time. And I'm extremely, extremely disappointed with the mayor and the city council of that city. We signed a non-piracy agreement. I know what non-compete agreements are. I know now, and I knew then, that you can never sign one with somebody with more money than you have, because you'll always get bought out. With that in mind, I would like to go to the Cedar Rapids City Council and take my agreement and tear it up right in front of them. We cannot trust that city, and we need to review all contracts and 28 e agreements we have currently with the city of Cedar Rapids because they have proved untrustworthy in our agreement with them. And I'm sorry, but it's been bugging me. We have a moment of silence on Thursday, and there's other things I want to say then. So thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, you have a comment, Nick? Okay. I just want to take a moment to briefly respond to that because I think uh, I've been in the same position, uh, upset, obviously, how things have played out, uh, but again, cautious to make sure that uh, as a community, our reaction isn't about uh, a particular deal that could uh, be about one particular company. This is a, this is a bigger uh, conversation. Um, just a heads up, there will be a small article in the paper uh, since my memo was received and filed. That obviously gets the attention of the media. Uh, what I will say is uh, Lon and I did uh, have, have a meeting uh, with some of their staff uh, just uh, communicating our concerns about it. Um, I think from, from a Medco perspective, so not necessarily from a City of Marion perspective, uh, we're still weighing how we should respond to this because we're also entering uh, a legislative session where, as always, uh, as I mentioned in my memo, uh, TIF will be a, a target for people that uh, like to claim communities abuse it in different ways. So I've been reaching out to different economic development groups across the state to try and understand, gee, what, what should we be doing? Because we, we say to our legislature, uh, leave it alone, but what do we do then when uh, our, our local municipalities, whether it's our own, if it would be you guys, or, or if it would be our neighbors in this case, that we feel are uh, doing things that maybe aren't in the best interest of protecting the tool. I don't know what that's going to be, but I guess I will candidly uh, say and, and request of this body that, that uh, as I have tried to do myself, that we don't necessarily react in a way that's going to create more media hype and and and, and maybe harm relations even more than they may be today. Uh, I have had a couple of good conversations with council members. I, I think the interesting thing is, is that without us saying anything more than the conversations that, that we've had amongst ourselves and the information that I've provided to you, uh, within their own community, within the uh, other individuals that own uh, the similar type of office space uh, that this company is looking at, they are extremely unhappy with how um, their city hall and their development staff has, has handled this deal. So I guess I would request that we kind of watch how that plays out because, frankly, I, I think a lot of it is going to be resolved on their own without this being about Cedar Rapids or Marion. It's about what's being fair to the owners of any similar property uh, across our entire region. So um, I, I, 
I guess I ask for just let, let's be cautious in how we respond in a, in a professional manner because I don't think I don't think we need all this blowing up in a in a in a negative way that frankly makes whether it's us or Cedar Rapids be portrayed in a media light, in, in a in a negative light because it's it, it's just not it's not positive PR when we have businesses I think I've sh maybe shared with some of you in the past. When companies are looking at locating in a region, they're watching us before we know we we're being watched. And so these are the types of headlines that I think I probably refer to when we talk about stuff like that. We don't need a, a company that's researching our region to see that there's a battle between two municipalities on something like this. Uh, however, I do think, and, and, I, and I stand here saying this has not fallen off my radar, we need to continue to have those conversations but maybe those are had in a, in a more productive manner. I, I agree, it'd be just fine to go make a, a statement, but I don't think the results of that would be the, the, the type of productive results that we're looking for, so. Yeah, but Nick, it goes all the way back to, what was it, 1917 when the courthouse uh, <laughs> <laughs> went west? I mean, let's face it, this has been going on for a long time. Well, as I think, frankly, uh, Communities around us, I think, like as you were saying earlier, they're noticing the great things going on in our community. What, whether we uh, do, you know, so that that's just going to naturally get yeah. people excited when uh, projects look at coming to our community. Uh, people are envious of what's going on here, I think and I think that's, that's a really kind interesting of part of this whole story, is to see that you know we're actually <laughs> creating concern. I, I think Hiawatha was right. I don't believe they signed that agreement. Uh, they realized who they were dealing with. Am I right, Juan? They have, I believe, a resolution in place that was set up to make sure that they were complying with the TIF law, much like the one that we have between Marion and Hiawatha. We don't have the same type of a formalized agreement with uh, Hiawatha as we have with Cedar Rapids. So, But as far, and I should have done a disclaimer like they do on the radio, that I'm not speaking for the staff or the rest of the council, I'm <laughs> speaking for Paul Draper and I, I have dealt with them too long, and I, my trust level is gone, Nick. I, and I, I've been on your board. I, I've seen what happened over the years. And yeah. I, I agree. I just ask that I think, I think how any of us respond or how as we respond as a community um, has more long-term impacts to how we might even have healthy conversations down the road. Um, so I guess I just wanted to... I wanted to say that, but I wanted to also not let you think that we're just we're, we're, we're forgetting about it. I think we're trying to figure out how we can handle it in, a, in as productive way as possible. And I, there, there are some good folks on their city council that I think are just as upset uh, about how this particular deal went down as, as any of us are here. They have one that is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Nick. Uh, number nine, I uh, wanted to have a discussion with the council on uh, about our conversion of um, our old payroll and software systems over to the new so the new world software system. Uh, one of the things that we have discovered as we've gone through this process is that the ability to transfer our old data over to the new system is much, much more complex than we originally thought. Um, when we went into it, uh, we thought that it would be a fairly simple manner t matter to um, basically export the data from the old systems and then import it into the new systems. But for example, one of the things that we found on the payroll side is that to do an export, um, you have to actually export the individual payroll records off of each employee as their own field into their own sheet and then import them one by one. So for a long-term employee that may have been with the City of Marion for you know 25 years, you could end up with maybe 22,000 records that need to be transferred over. Um, to uh, It's just not something that we can accomplish um, with our own staff internally, as I think was originally something that was envisioned when we went through the software um, purchasing process. And um, to that end, to make sure that we can stay on schedule, we did solicit bids from uh, a couple of data conversion firms to see what it would cost to have, that, have those records brought over. So what we're looking at doing is two different components. One is the payroll side, which is employee pay and benefits, and then the utility billing data. This would not be all the records um, from the beginning of time that are in each one of those software packages. This would be a limited number of years so that we have 
have some history in there that we can draw back on. Uh, the utility billing side, um, we have a quote from a company who has extensive experience doing these type of conversions, particularly with uh, New World Systems, and that would be about 75,000. Of the 75,000, 50 of it would be the city's responsibility and about it's about a two-thirds, one-third split with the water department to have that data brought across. The payroll side actually is a little bit more expensive than that. Their initial quote is about 98,000 to bring that data across. Uh, but to give you an idea of what we'd be looking at um, on the payroll side, the firm doing the conversion is estimating about 600 hours for their staff to do it, and that's with people who are experts in doing this. So if you try to translate that across with something to try to do it in-house, I just can't carve out 10 weeks of one person doing nothing but creating spreadsheets and doing data conversions to get this data across and then be responsible for making sure that there's no, no errors or anything that are um, done throughout it. Uh, the utility billing data, uh, that cost would fall back to the utilities. Um, it would get apportioned out according to their percentage of the total um, utility book of business. So sanitary sewer fund, some of it would come out of those reserves. Same thing with the payroll software. Um, the payroll software, we would break that out according to percentage of payroll. So I'll pick on, for example, the road use fund. If the road use fund is 10% um, of the city's annual payroll, it would pay for 10% of the cost of that data conversion. So it wouldn't all come out of the property tax base. But we want to make sure that um, we are trying to get um, some other competitive quotes so that we can come back with a firm recommendation to the council on Thursday so that we can keep it on track. Um, with our schedule for New World, we are supposed to go live and start doing parallel um, payrolls in the new system and the old system starting in February so that we can make sure everything is working on the data conversion. Um, if we slip on that schedule, it starts to affect other things because payroll is slotted in and then community development module is slotted in and then so on down the line. So if we miss a deadline on one piece, it pushes the whole rest of the project back. So um, I know it's an expense and it's something that's going to cost a lot of money, but it is something and we're making a huge investment into this software package and I think as we bring this data across, it's important for us to make sure that it's done right. We will still maintain the old system for payroll for a period of time because we can't just abandon those records records, we have to be able to access them. As part of this proposal, what they will do is they will also, after the data conversion, will import uh, probably three years worth of payroll data into the new system. They'll create an Excel sheet of everything that's in the uh, ACS 400 software for all of the data back to the beginning of when that was put in so that we can pull information out of that. Um, what I don't want to have happen is four years from now to have the AS400 crash and then we have no access to payroll records and then all of a sudden we need it. So by them bringing it out and putting it into an Excel sheet, Excel is a Microsoft product, there's always going to be something out there that's going to be able to pull the data from that. So it'll prep us well going forward. Um, just for reference for council, I believe uh, for any records related to personnel, uh, I believe it's a minimum of 75 years that we have to keep those. So it's important for us to be able to have access to those payroll records for a long time. Lon, have you looked at New World to see if they offer a, a software module to attach on that would, would do this? Yeah, it's not... So it's more expensive <laughs> than oh, okay. actually having a data conversion company come in and do that to have them try to do it for us. Uh, we, were, we went out and we started looking for data conversion companies that have expertise with doing this. Um, there is actually a company locally that's given us a bid that did a data conversion for Coralville, similar to what um, we're talking about doing. The problem is, is they can't offer the comprehensive thing. They can do the data conversion, but then they can't go back in and do the data verification to make sure everything is okay. Um, it, it's complicated because if you think back, you know, we might have 25 years worth of payroll records in there, but every time a code has changed or how something is referred to in the software has changed, that's a new field, that's a new spreadsheet you have to create. So you think back all those records for every employee since the beginning of us using that software, it's very complicated. The local firm just doesn't have the capacity to do that verification part of the process, unfortunately. And then security, uh, 
I'll make sure that the stuff stays secure. Yeah, they'd be granted a limited access window for just a period of time to be able to come in and do the conversion, and then the, the window would be closed. And then make sure it doesn't go offshore. Make sure it stays in the U.S. That's two big concerns for people, pers you know, personnel data. Yep. So by Thursday, we should have everything for the comprehensive quote to be a, and the recommendation on the vendor that we would want to go with. We've gotten quotes from uh, from two vendors, or at least the partial one from the second. We're trying to uh, get a number from a third to make sure that you know, we're just getting good competitive numbers on it. Okay. And then on the mayoral appointments, I did have one comment on that. Uh, we were contacted by Mr. Weaver, who had indicated that he does not have an interest in being on the local option sales tax oversight committee. So, okay. Who, well, who, who is the member that whose term ended? Is uh, that, Phil Hirschner. Is that Phil? Mm -hmm. And I, I think he would want to be reappointed. I've, I've asked him. Yeah, he did indicate an interest in being reappointed, but it wasn't until after. Yeah. I don't think he realized that he was going off until after this was already in process. Okay. Anything else? Can we uh, just quickly take a picture of the council? Uh. Would that be okay? We can uh, we can adjourn the meeting if you want, and then. Have some, have, have some take pictures. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>